Shakespeare would be speaking early modern English. Then we have Middle English. Then if we go further back a thousand years ago, that's where we get to Old English. And so the language is actually quite different. It's not just a matter of putting thou and thy into it. I'll sketch out a kind of plan of attack that's going to be relatively pain-free and fun. Although your mileage on fun may vary. YouTube, welcome. If you have clicked on this video, you may have some small interest in Old English. And the job of this video is to take that small interest and make it bigger. If you already have a big interest, then maybe we can just add a little bit more onto it. But, but the big thing is I want to get you excited about studying Old English and I want to get you feeling like it's within your grasp. It's not going to be a mountain that's um, unclimbable. It's not going to be an insurmountable obstacle. It's not going to be a river that you can't cross. It's going to be something achievable. So here we go. We're going to talk about Old English. I don't think I even need to put myself in the corner uh, to talk about Old English. This is a language. If you are not familiar, this is a language that is the ancestor of the language that I'm speaking to you in right now. So for those who have not studied the history of English, you may be under the impression that Old English is uh, something like how Shakespeare spoke. It's actually quite a bit farther back than that. So if Shakespeare's English is, if we're speaking today present day English or modern English, Shakespeare would be speaking early modern English. So it's really more or less the same language as today. Um, then we have to go back into the Middle Ages. We The, the later Middle Ages, we have Middle English, which is something like uh, the language that Chaucer spoke. And then if we go further back still, a thousand years ago, that's where we get to Old English. And so the language is actually quite different from from modern English, it's not just a matter of putting thou and thy into it. Um, but nevertheless, it does have a, a, a link with, with modern English. And it's a language that is fascinating to study because it's at once familiar and foreign. So to give you an idea of what this is like, I'm gonna show you a little text. A little text, now I'll put myself in the corner. And I'll show you a little text in Old English. This is a text that some of you may be familiar with. This is the Lord's Prayer, um, which in modern English starts off a little something like Our Father who art in heaven. Depending on the translation, you get different things there, but uh, it's, it's, this, it's this text. And so if I were to give this to you in Old English, it would be this. And I'll just read it out so you can get a, sound, a sense of the sound of Old English. So, Fader Ure, Thu the art on Helvonum, si thin nama ye halhod, tobe cume thin rice, ye wurde thin villa, on erdan swa swa on Helvonum. Urne ye dai homni chan hlav, sele us to dai, on for yif us ure gultas, swa swa we for yivath urum gultendum, and ne ye lad thu us on kostnunge. Ak alis us of uvele, sodrice. So, not entirely comprehensible, but there are some things that we can point to that are uh, that are clear relatives of, of words that we know. So, father, fader. Uh, let's see. Let's get my my mouse over here. Uh, fader. Um, you might recognize hevonum, right? This sounds a lot like heaven, and in fact, that's the uh, this is the ancestor of the word heaven. We have things like nama, name, hallowed be thy name. This is the modern English or the early modern English, I guess. Um, si thi nama yehalrod. Uh, we have things like willa for will. Um, erdan, which is a form of, of the word for earth. Uh, what else do we have here that's really obviously related? Uvele, uvele, a form of the word for evil. So we have a few things that are, are kind of similar. Todai, today, right? We have some things that are similar, but then we have other things here like kostnunge, on kostnunge. What does that mean? This is not something that survived into modern English, so it's, it's a bit hard for us to, uh, to parse. Or a, a word like yedai huamlich, here in the form yedai huamlichan, um, which means daily. Uh, obviously, we didn't get that full word uh, passed down to us into modern English. Uh, so what I propose to do today is take you line by line through this, through the Lord's Prayer, and show you these connections and the differences. And then I'll 
sketch out a kind of plan of attack if you want to study Old English, be it with a teacher, on your own, whatever, uh, in a way that's going to be relatively pain-free and fun. Although your mileage on fun may vary depending on the sort of stuff you're into. But if you're into reading stuff like Beowulf, then you will find it very fun. So line by line, Fader ure, thu the arton hevonum. Fader ure, father, our. So ure is also the, the direct ancestor of, of the word our, um, the first person plural um, possessive. Fader ure, here we have father our instead of our father, but more or less it's, it's uh, not so hard to see what's going on here. Uh, thu, thu the art on hevonum, thu. This thu is the second person singular pronoun, which gives us the modern English thou, not something we use a great deal. Um, but you can see here uh, a little something that you may have run into before called the great vowel shift, the effect of the great vowel shift. So here we have long u in ure and long u in thu. So U, long U in Old English, is generally going to come down into modern English as au. So, ure, our. Thu, thou. Uh, there are a few other changes between those words, but this is a good, uh, a good way to get started when you see an Old English word and you're thinking, okay, what's going on here? Um, if you see a long U, try putting it into modern English with an au sound. Um, and you're, you're often going to be on track. Thu, Fe. Fe here is a, a relative marker. So you who are, thu the art, thou who art, you know, if you want to put it into a, a more literal, uh, more literal uh, word for word translation, but for the meaning, you who are on hevonum, uh, in heaven. So let's, let's go a little bit slower. Art, um, this is a form of the verb to be, uh, the second person singular, thu art which gives us modern English, thou art. Again, not something that uh, in standard English uh, is used a lot, but it does come up. Also gratuitous. No, let's, let's put that full screen so you can see. I have the best friends. This is a gift. Whatever. Um, we had on hevonum. On is in the West Saxon dialect, the, the preposition that we, we often used in the place of in. So interestingly, modern English does not descend from uh, West Saxon, or sorry, yeah, what modern English does not descend from West Saxon. It descends from a different dialect of Old English. So when I say that modern, that Old English is the ancestor of modern English, there's some sort of asterisk that has to be put next to that. But um, because we don't say on heaven, we say in heaven, and in wasn't really used very much in West Saxon which is the, uh, the dialect that we study when we study Old English traditionally, which is uh, kind of like the, the standard language at the time. Uh, yeah, so, Fader ure thu the art on hevonum. Our father, you who are in heaven, would be the modern English translation. All right. So, first line, not so bad. Uh, obviously, there's some new stuff here, but almost all of these words have reflexes in modern English. Father, our, thou... Um, the is not used as a relativizer anymore, but with the, uh, that aside, thou um, who art on heaven, not so, so far off. I think it's borderline comprehensible. All right, next. See thee nama yahalhod. So, hallowed be thy name. This is the usual translation um, into modern English, or at least it's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, but if we're, we're to take this Literally, this is something like um, we have a, a subjunctive form of the verb to be, see, uh, which means something like, in this case, may, may it be, let it be. Um, see, thin nama, uh, your name, or thin is, of course, the, of course, well, thin is the ancestor of thy or thine. Um, it's interesting. We talked about the, um, if I go back, we talked about the fate of these long u vowels. In, um, in modern English, they turn to ow because of the great vowel shift. And the long e vowels likewise turn into i a lot of the time in modern English. This is the regular, the regular outcome of long e in Old English is i in modern English. So thine, 
See thin nama yahalrod. I should probably say something about this this ie diphthong. Um, this is a bit unclear. Uh, the pronunciation of this diphthong is a bit unclear, uh, or rather debated. It's only found in in very few texts, and uh, it's sort of if you're if you're learning Old English, it's often put in the the version of Old English that you learn because it's easiest to go from this standard, which is Early West Saxon, which has this ie diphthong, to other varieties. Uh, it's easier to go from from Early West Saxon to others than it is to go from others to Early West Saxon. So uh, I my convention is to pronounce it like e, uh, but it does show up as u in in other in other varieties. So si thin nama yahalrod. Uh, may be your name, thin nama, nama, name, right? Uh, Yahalrod. So this, uh, is, this is an inflected form of the verb halgian, which means to, to make holy, to make something holy. Holy um, is the Old English word for holy, so yahalgian, you can sort of see it's smushed together in there, to make something holy. And this is how we. This is where we get the word "hallowed" from, or "hallow," like in um, the Deathly Hallows or Halloween. Um, so, see the name Yahalrod. May your name be made holy. All right. Tobekume thin riche. Tobekume thin riche. Tobekume is another subjunctive form. I'm gonna cut some of this. Uh, I gotta move myself. There we go. Um, is another subjunctive form. So you saw above we have C, uh, a subjunctive form of to be. This is giving us this sense of may it be, may it be so, uh, such and such, may it be like so. And so here we have tobekume, which is another subjunctive form, meaning may may something approach. May may what approach? Or, or draw near. Uh, so this, you can sort of see the root that gives us become in this. Um, so may what draw near? Thin riche, uh, your kingdom, thy kingdom. Um, riche is going to be cognate um, with. Uh, I don't. Th we don't have anything in modern English that descends from riche, but this is the kind of thing that you get like in um, um, in German uh, Reich. So uh, this is uh, kingdom. It comes from uh, it comes from a, a root meaning sort of area of authority or dominion. Uh, so, tobe kume thin riche. Uh, may your kingdom come. Here we have another subjunctive clause. Ye wurde thin willa. Ye wurde thin willa. Um, this is the verb werdan, werdan in Old English, giving us, um, by the way, I don't know if we've I've mentioned explicitly, but this uh, this character here, um, which is called thorn, is pronounced th or the, depending on its position in the word. Ye wurde thin willa. Werdan can mean become, uh, or it can mean to come to pass, to happen. Um, so, ye wurde thin willa. May, may your will, thin willa, willa, giving us will, uh, come to pass or to happen. Um, thy will be done. Uh, you, you'll often hear uh, it rendered into, or you'll, you'll hear the, the, <laughs> the modern English version anyway, early modern English version. Ye wurde thin willa. Yeah, so what happens is th, and actually all fricatives, are voiced uh, between, between vowels or sonorants. Um, so ye wurde, so r is a sonorant. Ye wurde thin willa. Yes. All right. So yeah, that is the, the, the King James Version. Thy will be done. And where? Where, where is thy will going to be done? On erdan swa swa on helvonum. On erdan swa swa on helvonum. So this has a slightly different um, a slightly different structure than, than the modern English. Some stuff to, to comment on. So on, on erdan, on earth... Okay, nothing super interesting there other than the fact that um, uh, that we have an N on the end of, uh, of the word for earth. And this is simply um, a fact of the, uh, this is simply owing to the fact that it's the object of on. Um, a little bit of an aside 
pedagogically speaking, uh, I don't really like to emphasize people studying, you know, tables of endings and things. Rather, I like to just expose people to more and more of these patterns and then watch them get built up by, by your own minds, which are really good at picking up on these patterns. Uh, so just, I've put it in a different color here so that you notice that something's going on there, but we don't have to worry about the, uh, the specifics too much. So on erdan swa swa on hevonum. Uh, on earth, swa swa. Uh, this is on, so swa is the word that gives us so in modern English. Another little trick along a, this a sound is going to often go into o in modern English. So swo or so um, is the reflex of swa. I think we had one earlier as well, didn't we? Maybe we didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't happen here, though, so never mind. <laughs> yeah, for every world, there's an exception, right? Um, it does happen in the, the word holy, meaning holy, um, which has a long A in, in Old English. Um, right, so, on erdan swa swa on hevonum. On earth, as swa swa, uh, this is not... Uh, we don't say on earth, so, so in heaven, um, in modern English, but this was the way that you expressed as or like in old English, either just with swa or by swa repeated. So swa swa, which kind of sounds cool. Um, and I kind of, I'm reminded of swa from the uh, <laughs> Tokipona Ruin Lex stream. Um, nevertheless, on heavenum, we've seen this before, in heaven. Okay. Oh yeah, that should be, that should say Earth. There we go. Thank you, uh, thank you, Max, for the uh, for the correction. Okay, this is a fun one. Urne ye dai huam li chan hlaf, sele us to dai. All right. So, translation: Give us today our daily bread. Um, although, if we were to put it in the Old English word order, it would be our daily bread. Give us today. So this urne yedai huam li chan hlaf is one phrase. Uh, urne, this is uh, a different form, the accusative singular form, um, masculine, if you uh, are curious, but I would encourage you not to be too curious at this point, uh, of, that, of that ure which we had before, which gave us our. So urne yedai huam li chan, daily. And you can see in here, I don't know if you can see, you can see dai. So this G, we have D and then this AE ligature, which is which is just like the IPA. Ah. Um, and then we have this G with a dot on it. And it's worth talking about this G with a dot on it, which I'm pronouncing Y. Uh, I mean, it was certainly pronounced Y. Um, the reason that we um, the reason that we put a little dot on it is to indicate that this is a, the kind of G that's pronounced Y. Uh, so we have ye dai huam li chan. Um, similarly, we put its dot on top of the C to, uh, to indicate that it was pronounced ch. Uh, this has to do with uh, the sound changes in the history of English uh, going back before the time it was written down, uh, where you have uh, the C's and G's get palatalized, you know, kind of like what happened in French, Italian, and Spanish. Um, it's the story of uh, g G -k, those velar sounds in languages whenever they're next to front vowels they love to just go into j or ch or ts or j or y in this case um so you can treat it as a y a yod or a, like a y sound so ye dai huam li chan ye dai huam li chan day so we even have that that y uh, persisting into modern english ye dai huam li chan daily that's interesting it's also interesting that we have this suffix huam on here which comes from uh the <laughs> the same root as whom um here it means kind of like every and it's a bit to me at least mysterious the relationship between whom and every um although it is um notable that yehua uh, has the same root and it means every um nevertheless that's kind of interesting but i think what's more interesting is hlaf Hlaf is uh, a word for bread, but this is, the, this is the ancestor of loaf. 
So urne yedai huamli chan hlaf, our daily loaf, you know, literally speaking, but our daily bread. Um, hlaf is a great word because it, it gives us uh, so many other, or well, it gives us a few other interesting words. One is hlavort, um, which is the ancestor of modern English lord. So hlavort uh, is literally the the guard, the ward of the hlaf, the loaf. So the person who's guarding the loaf. <laughs> Um, is the Lord. And, you know, that's a very important function uh, for someone to uh, to occupy. You got to keep the loaves safe, right? Uh, and Armonica has a quick question What uh, that the digraph got flipped. Which digraph are you uh, are you talking about there? Yeah, while you answer that, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sele. Um, sele. Sele is uh, from the verb sellan, which means not to sell, but to give. So the original meaning of this verb, which comes down into modern English as sell, was give. Or or actually, sometimes it could also have the meaning of to like betray someone. So you can you think of calling someone a sellout, right? Um, this is actually a very, very old meaning of the word sell, uh, which, which meant just neutrally to give or to give someone over uh, as in to betray them. Uh, here, there's there's no connotation of betrayal. It just means give. Uh, so urne yedai huamli chan hlaf sele. So give our daily bread. Give our daily bread to whom? Us sele us. Give us our daily bread. So this is a, a another form of um, of the second of the first person plural pronoun. Uh, here, of course, <laughs> the of course I say of course because every rule has an exception. Our our long vowel u doesn't turn into aus. Uh, it it's uh, it comes down to modern English as us. Oh, uh, the HW digraph. Uh, I believe that has to do with the influence of um, new standards of um, orthography that were brought in with the Norman, uh, the Norman scribes in the Middle English period. Uh, so yeah, Huat HW is how it was written in Old English, and then it becomes it turns into a WH later on. Um, there are a lot of things like that uh, where a different scribal tradi tradition came in, namely the Norman tradition. Um, tra people trained in France uh, replaced the people who were trained in England, uh, the scribes. And so um, a lot of, uh, so we lost our, our, our th, our thorn. Where was that again? Yeah, here, our good friend. This gets turned into a TH by those, those self-same scribes. Um, yes. Okay. So, sele us todai. Todai, today. So, here we have that dai root as well, meaning day. Kuliulio. What else? And for yif us ure gultas. And for yif us ure gultas. So, and, and, no mystery there. For yif, um, this is a bit of an interesting word because we have, it looks very, very plainly like forgive, but notice that g -g -g -g, we didn't inherit a palatalized form of that. We don't say forgive in modern English. We say forgive. And um, this has to do either with, well, there are two sort of interesting, interesting reasons why this might be the case. One is that not all Old English varieties uh, participated in this palatalization, especially the more northerly varieties. Um, and so you have the, the varieties of Old English ancestral to Scots, which uh, don't have church, but have kirk, kirk, um, because that k to ch palatalization didn't happen there. So that could be a cause. And the other thing that could be a cause is, um, well, at a certain point, there were a lot of Scandinavians in England um, due to the the whole sort of Viking era scene, and uh, over large parts of England, you had um, you had people speaking Old Norse, and you had a lot of contact between Old Norse speakers and Old English speakers, and as a result, a lot of uh, a lot of words in Old English or a lot of words in Modern English come not from the Old English form of the word, but from the Old Norse form of the word, or a version of the Old English that's kind of influenced by the Old Norse, so it doesn't have that palatalization. Because, in fact, Old Norse did not have that palatalization. Um, so, yes, we have give instead of yiv. But we still have uh, yield, uh, which was from uh, yildan, to pay. Um, 
or to to yeah to to pay to to give tribute anyway so that's for yif for yif us ure giltas so we've seen us before we've seen ure before forgive us our giltas what are giltas these are this is the ancestor of the modern english word guilt uh, but it's it's more broad in old english than just guilt you know forgive us our guilt um, this could be debts, offenses, crimes, sins, um, any of these things. I've, I've said offenses here because it's going to um, play nicely with the, the line that follows. On the forgif us ure gultas. And this is the front rounded vowel. U. Oh, I see some excellent, uh, some excellent history of English orthography stuff going on in the chat. Very good. All right. And here's our swa swa again. Swa swa we forgivath urum Giltendum. So, swa swa as, we've seen this before, we, we, here's another great vowel shift freebie. So, we have the long e, the long e sound, um, and this comes into modern English as e, this e sound. I mean, there is a reason that we call the letter, this letter here, e and not e in, uh, in modern English, uh, just for the same reason. So, we becomes we. Um, so, swa swa we forgivath, as we forgive, forgivan, forgive, could also mean grant or give, but not in this case. Uh, as we forgive, who do we forgive? Urum giltendum. So, urum is another form of that ure, our. Giltendum. What is this? This is a form of the verb, uh, of a verb meaning to, to be in, to, to sin, to offend, to be in debt. Uh, so these are the ones who are in debt or the ones who offend. We forgive the ones who offend. Yeah, the, the archaic participial form um, of the verb. So uh, we, uh, in modern English, we, we use um, ing with the velar nasal here. Um, but originally it was und. So if I were to m sort of mechanically try and bring this forward into modern English, it would be our, our giltons. Uh, this I and apostrophe um, ending is the descendant of this end. And uh, yeah, so that's giltendum. As we forgive our offenders, as we forgive those who trespass against us, I think would be the, is the KJV. <laughs> um, I remember that from school. Um, but here, it's there's no circumlocution about you know people offending against us. It's our urum giltendum, uh, our offenders, or our debtors. That also works. What's next? On ne jeladthu us on kostnunge. Okay, on ne jelad jelad lead. So this, this long a ah often comes into modern English as this ea digraph, which gets pronounced in different ways according to a very complicated history, um, either a or e, uh, most of the time e. So yelad uh, becomes lead. Interestingly, this little prefix ye, we've seen this before a few times. Um, a lot of the time this just drops out into modern English. In, just, in some cases, we do keep it uh, in... Um, it just turns into a little schwa in some words, but uh, but in in the case of yelad, it uh, it just drops out altogether. So and ne yelad thu, and and not lead thou literally if we do word for word, but more idiomatically and don't lead, do not lead. We don't have this do support in old English uh, that we have in modern English, and do not lead us us on kostnunge. What is kostnung? Kostnung is Temptation. This is a word that we have in modern English, which, uh, which for those who uh, who have a, a, a taste for these things and a sense for these things, can recognize this as a a French or uh, Latin loan. Temptation. Uh, the the giveaway is the Asian. The native Old English word was kostnung, uh, which does not survive, uh, but it comes from a um, it comes from a uh, an old Germanic root meaning to 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 test or tempt and ne yelad thu us on kostnunge ak alis us of 
Yvele. Sodliche. Okay. Ak is but. Um, yeah, we, we have not, uh, we've not kept ak around, sadly. Uh, next we have alis, which means to deliver, to release, or redeem. You can, um, you can note that there's a kind of, there's a connection to uh, the root, which gives us loose, loosen. So, you know, if you're releasing someone from something, you could think about loosening, loosening their fetters um, and allowing them to go free. So, alis us, deliver us, of, in Old English, of, more generally meant from. Um, so not just not just the way we would think of it in modern English as of, uh, possession. In fact, they had a whole genitive case to deal with that, but it's often used uh, in the sense of from. So ak alis us, ak alis us of uvele, uvele. Um, this is this is evil, right? Uh, just spelt a bit differently. You can see the the allophonic voicing of f. So whenever you have a, a voiceless fricative in between two vowels or, or a sonar and a vowel, uh, it'll get voiced, just like we saw with erdan. We have uvele, not uvele. And so this gives us evil. Yeah, and so this, if I were consistent with my uh, my little system here, I would attempt to copy and paste on a Windows machine. It's not easy. Uh, evil. There we go. Thank you, Max. And then we only have one word left and we're finished. Uh, sodliche. Sodliche. This is the word that they used for amen in Old English. Literally, it means truly or indeed. So sodliche. You can recognize, um, for those who like uh, some of the more old-timey Renaissance fair style language, the word forsooth, uh, which means in truth. So sooth um, is the modern English descendant of soth. Soth meaning truth. So sodliche is truly but in this case, it's used as amen. And now that's that's the whole thing. We went through, it looks a bit, you know, daunting perhaps. It may look a bit daunting, but actually when you go through it line by line, it's not actually that bad. There are a lot of things that are familiar that are maybe hidden by the orthography. So like evil, evil, right? This is evil, um, which we would expect uh, knowing the modern English uh, equivalent and deliver us from evil. Um, so that is hopefully a little bit of a taste of what it's like to start reading in Old English. Um, now, obviously, I'll come back to the uh, the full screen uh, webcam. Obviously, there's um, there's stuff to learn, right? There is vocabulary, there's grammar. But um, my philosophy is that the more you read, the more that stuff will just start to get into your head. So my advice for those who are considering embarking on Old English whether it's uh, with me or whether it's on your own or with someone else, is to try to optimize for the amount of time you spend actually reading the language. What we've done today is kind of the equivalent of going through a text with a, uh, a dictionary. Um, and this is a good way to get started when there really aren't a ton of resources um, for, for being able to read widely in Old English. There aren't a lot of texts yet um, that are made for, for learners. So what you have to do is sort of jump into the deep end and start reading texts that you're interested in. Um, there's a reason, after all, presumably that you want to learn the language, you want to read some texts, you know, maybe you want to read Beowulf. Um, that's That was certainly my goal when I started. And so I just sat down with a dictionary and started going through it. And it was it was tough going at first because, you know, it's, it's poetry and it's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. There's all sorts of endings, all sorts of uh, vocabulary I don't know, but as I keep doing it, as I keep reading more and more of it, my mind starts building up a little bit of a, a model of how Old English works. And then the more I read, the more that model gets built. And, and the same is true, the same will happen for you when you start to read, um, when you start to read widely in Old English. So my goal uh, in teaching beginners Old English at this point, because we don't have the pedagogical texts available, we have to sort of figure out a way of getting people reading Old English as soon as possible. So shorten the time from I know nothing about Old English to I have a trusty dictionary in my hand, I can make my way through any text. And that's what that's what I aim to do with, with this, this upcoming course that's starting next week. Um, but I think what I'll do 
is open the floor to questions. I'll, I'll say goodbye to YouTube first. YouTube, thank you for joining us. If you've been watching this um, in the far distant future, hopefully you've got some inspiration and an idea of what Old English is like and a sense that you have the ability to accomplish it. Accomplish the goal of reading Old English yourself. Even if you need a dictionary, you can do it. So um, go forth and read Old English and we will see you again.